morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. A blessed Pentecost season to all of you this Tuesday, June the 14th, as the light of Christ shines on us from Genesis chapter 16. As we get to these vital chapters in Holy Scripture, it is very real. We always hear of the, the, the flood account, and you're like, oh, this is great. Everything is working, new, new creation, new everything, and things kind of fell apart once they got to dry land. We also look at the relationships of Abraham. Your name will be blessed, and he gives a covenant of the Lord. Genesis 15 is a renewal of that covenant that was counted to him as righteousness through faith. And then we get to chapter 16, and the wheels fall off again. It makes us realize a number of things. As brokenness surrounds the story, we see the mercy of God even upon Hagar. And as God is merciful to Hagar, he is merciful to us. And his mercy is there for us today, all on account of Christ. So we bring all that together. We see this reality. So open up your Bibles, put on your Christ goggles, for the gifts are ready, ready for you. Thank you to our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation for your support of Thy Strong Word. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. Helping us to be strengthened by God's Word this morning, we welcome regular guest Pastor John Shank of Trinity Lutheran Church and School in Edwardsville, Illinois. Pastor Shank, welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Well, it's good to be back. It's, uh, you know, every once in a while there's a little bit of a break there, which is, uh, I, I don't... Uh, I don't uh, begrudge having a, a break, but it's nice to be nice to be back and and uh, being with you and yeah. uh, congratulations to you. Um, but uh, but yeah, so to be back and and to deal with this text Genesis sixteen, it's you know I, I actually had forgotten some of the aspects of this text, which are are quite uh, quite rich and quite comforting too, right. quite comforting to all of us uh, as we reflect. Uh, on the nature of our God and on the grace and mercy of our God. And that, you know, I am really looking forward to that as well. But let's start here. Like you said, you have a little bit of a break, if you will. So tell us what's going on for you, your family, and the saints at Trinity. So, yeah, we have just finished up another school year. We, um, all of our summer programs and camps are underway. Our, our, you know, kind of Edwardsville is a, is a booming area, so we have more and more kids. So that's a, a blessing to us and and to our school, our daycare, all those things. Preschools growing, our schools growing. Uh, so all that is is wonderful, and and praise the Lord for for He's the one who who gathers up. It's not like we have this new marketing and we've changed our done. No, uh, God is good <laughs> and He is gracious and He. Uh, he gathers up, and we are we are so thankful for that, and uh, understand the responsibility we have to proclaim His Son in all that we do, and, and every child that comes through, um, uh, may they know the Lord and know uh, the grace and mercy and the love of the Lord for for them. Um, yeah, uh, so that's what we're doing. We got VBS coming up, and and lots of things too. So, um, so uh, it's a great time. Great time to be in the church. Great. Oh, that's a great way to put it, uh, Pastor. I remember Dale Meyer at uh, Concordia Seminary in St. Louis when I had homiletics class with him. One of the things that he would say to us often is he would say, it's a great time to be in the church. Great time to be a preacher. Great time to serve. Great time for your pe- for not your people, the laity to be able to serve in their vocations. And I remember we just had a lot of moments where, you know, we're all 22, 23 years old. And kind of like, you know what, we haven't heard that very often throughout our life. And it's not because everyone's a downer, but a lot of times people are always saying, well, it used to be great, and then no longer. But like you said, people are still hearing the word of God. It's a great time to be the church. Why? Because Christ still reigns over his church. And so that's a great reminder for us. And I pray that, I, I ask the listeners to pray for that. May we all be able to say those great words because Christ is truly Risen, risen indeed. So, Pastor, can you begin our time knowing that fact, that joy that we have this morning, and begin us in prayer? Yes, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Holy Father, you are our gracious and merciful. You have sent your Son to be our Savior, for you truly do hear us 
in our our prayers to you. You do see us in our affliction. You know our need even more than we ourselves, and you know how to answer that need. You see this so perfectly and completely in the promise, the promise of a son, your son, who has borne our grief and our sorrows, who has born our sins and is our Savior, who rejoice in the pouring, outpouring of the, the gifts of your Son, where he has poured out his Spirit upon his church. Help us, O oh Lord, to live and rejoice in that gift and to proclaim, to proclaim the mighty works that you have done from age to age and generation to generation. You are our God. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have any questions concerning our text, Genesis chapter 16, send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, kfuo at kfuo.org. Pastor, we're going to begin this way by hearing the word of God. Like you said today, you know, we've heard this many times. Often, if you ever do a reading plan, you get through Genesis at the very least, and you've read through this, but typically we kind of just plow through as fast as we can. So Sarai and Hagar is a very... Um, soap opera type of uh, text, at the same time, very rich, as you said, in God's grace. So let's keep that in mind as we hear the word of God, Genesis 16. We'll be reading from the English Standard Version. We will read the whole chapter up to verse 16. We hear the word of God. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord Yahweh has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that he had conceived... She looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord Yahweh judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord, Yahweh, found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord, Yahweh, said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord said, also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord Yahweh has listened to your affliction. She shall be a, he shall be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord Yahweh, who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well shall be called Be'er Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. This is our text today, and boy, even reading this, I'm like, oh, I don't remember that. That's something I haven't mentioned before. Um, but Pastor, this is all in a context. So tell us about the context or main themes you want to highlight to start us off. Sure. As we've, as we've heard now, this is 10 years. So 10 years, they, Abram, or Abram, but the Abraham, but I've got to, I got to wait. Right? <laughs> exactly. Abram was, was called uh, by the Lord. Uh, he had uh, come and, and, and left his home country, his people, and uh, had followed the, the direction of the Lord. And Sarai had gone with him. They had gone. Um, and, and and now after after 10 years, we, we had left the text. Um, you had the, uh, the reality of the struggle of, of not having an, an, an heir in uh, 
would, would it fall on one of his servants? I mean, he, the Lord had uh, come and had spoken to, to, to Abram, had made a covenant with him, had this promise, um, this promise holds him. He is, is now held in and by the promise that he would have a son. Well, now we get into chapter 16, and, and yes, they're holding on to the promise that Abram would have a son, and now they're struggling. Now, is this really going to be by, by Sarai, or is it going to, is there going to be some surrogacy? Uh, is there going to be another who will have to, to step in and have a child? Um, for is is God's promise also for her? Uh, what are they going to do? And and so that that struggle, that tension, is the real tension of our text. Uh, it's when I was looking through Luther's commentary, paging through. It seems one that we should recommend even more. I know we recommend taking a look at Genesis commentary by Luther, but we should recommend it all the more. It's it's, it's almost like he was. You know, it's like, right, did, did he write that today? Mm. Did he write it today about the struggle of, of um, you know, how, how when we look at this text, I think the first thing that jumps out to our people is, the, is their decision and the sense of the action taken. Um, but Luther would point out, because that's our own lust and our own struggle and, and that we like to, to think of scandal and, and all these things, but the real struggle of the text is how they wrestle in the promise. They're wrestling with the promise that God had given and the timing that God has in fulfilling the promise. And I think that's really the Christian life. And our life is, is wrestling with the promise that God has given to us and the timing that God has for his promise of, of resurrection and life forever and his promise of his coming. Um, and, and yet here we are um, in these 10 years in, in our waiting. Well, and how, how anxious do we get, you know, um, waiting an hour? <laughs> and yet yeah. something like this at their old age, we're not getting any younger here, God, you know. Um, and now now you're going to tell us to wait even more. Yeah, you told us the promise, but... I, you know, I'm 99 now. I'm 100 now. This is this. I mean, it wasn't possible at 91, but now it really doesn't seem possible. So it's it's a true testament of we understand our lack of ability to wait. Um, any other anything else you want to highlight as we dig in before we dig? Yeah, in? you know, as you talk about that, you know, which will be coming in in the in the chapter still yet to to be studied about because now we're 10 years later, so we're 85, 86, right? You know, is 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 Sarai getting to the point where um, it it seems physically impossible um, mm-hmm. to pass that age? Um, well, it seems like that will be the, the later um, answer when when Sarai comes. Sarah laughs at the promise of the Lord that this is her; she will be the one uh, by which the promise will come, and um, she seems to be convinced that this is. Um, not physically possible, um, but uh, but God is is always working His promise, not by what is physically possible, but for us, but what is what is um, what is only possible for Him. And so we have connections between Sarai and and Mary. Mary, yeah. also it's called Mary. Yeah. Mary, <laughs> I love it. I love Mary. It. On how on how she responds, let it be done to me according to your word, right? So she's going to cling to the word. You said it. I'm going to believe it, right? And Sarai is going to say, "Well, here's the word. Now, how am I going to do it?" It's like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. It's not your doing. It's not your doing. And so there's there's definitely connections there on um and and you know not only a how the promise is fulfilled, not by what is what is capable and what is able for us, but what is only able for the Lord. Uh, and then their responses to the word of the Lord are different, obviously. It's a whole different story, but boy, you can make that connection because here, her response, and then you have the angel of the Lord who speaks. And it's sure. fascinating because you have that, you know, that Malak Yahweh language throughout the Old Testament and, and that is 
very important. And I will admit, if you were to give me the top list, I would go to the burning bush. I would go to Abram, Abraham when he's with Isaac. I would go to other parts where there's some little bit, a little more hidden. Is that the angel of the Lord? Is it not? But I don't think off the top of my head, I would have put Hagar in that list of the angel of the Lord coming into this as well. So I think that's just something for you, our listeners, to remember too as we look at the rest of this. This is a very important piece of the Old Testament, and here it is, the merciful Lord right in the midst of a very broken situation. Anything else, Pastor, before we dig in? No, let's uh, let's dig in. All right, so chapter 16, we'll start with verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had bore him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord Yahweh has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. I'm going to stop there because, well, that's uh, that sets the tone a little bit. What are what are some of the issues that we see in these first two verses, or other highlights you have? So I think when people read this, and as Luther kind of pointed out, our first thoughts go to the action, right? And and start thinking is this uh, prescriptive of how we can then be, and you know, can we have uh, multiple wives or you know things like all that, but. Um, Again, Luther does a good job of drawing us back to the struggle of the promise. And so, no, uh, I would make it clear to our, my members, <laughs> no, this is not um, telling us that it's okay uh, to have uh, multiple wives where is this what marriage is or anything like that. It's, it's not. Um, we're talking about a promise. Uh, and really not just a promise, but the promise. Mm-hmm. And how do they struggle with this promise? So this this is the promise by which the Savior of the world will come. Um, so this hasn't happened, and yet the Lord had promised that it would happen. Um, so are we getting to the point where we need to step in and uh, figure out a way for the promise to be fulfilled? Because obviously we need the seed of the woman. We We need... Uh, the Lord to continue to, to bless us uh, in this um, salvific way, which will come uh, through this through this promised one. So I think that struggle is is true. Now we can understand and kind of back into the cultural issues. That yes, culturally there was practices, and uh, there's even contracts that people can have found archaeologically where um, you know. If the, the the woman could not uh, bear a child, well, then her um, her handmaiden would bear a child, kind of in proxy. Obviously, we think of these things differently because we have different practices, uh, which are uh, manifestly different. Um, neither one, I would say, neither one has uh, is is a is the answer that maybe our members should be looking at. Uh, they should be maybe looking at. Um, bearing the, the cross, but again, we're talking about a promise given to Abraham. That promise is not given to me. I, I was not promised that I would have children. I rejoice that the Lord has, has granted children. Uh, Sarai is right that it is the Lord who does this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not our, our doing, though. <laughs> After she says this, that she tries to do it. Um, she tries to step in and be the answer. So um, we have to understand our cultural realities here. Um, and, uh, but the real struggle is how do we handle having been given such a promise and yet the promise not being fulfilled. And so the, like you said, the, we quickly go to the action. We try to, and, and this has been very messy, I would say in our culture today that marriage has never been uplifted as, as much as it should be, I'll say it that way, in our culture. However, there was always a standard understanding of this is what marriage is. And now that definition is all over the place. And so, but, but at the same time, we still have this kind of understanding of, okay, this is good and this is not good in general society. Here, it's very clear that what they're attempting to do is not what God said. What she's saying is not what God wanted. She knew the Lord had prevented her from bearing children, 
But she doesn't say, I'm going to trust the Lord, and when he's going to do it, he does. No, she takes the action as opposed to allowing God to take the action. Um, and so that's one aspect. And then, fascinated at the end of verse 2, where it says, And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And this, how could we not also see the, the Adam and Eve story? Where, right. <laughs> where it's Eve who's talking to serpent. And you always assume Adam is like on the other side of the garden, you know, to, you know, uh, getting the hoe out, you know, working on the ground. I'm doing Obviously, he doesn't have to at that point, but he's somewhere else. He's eating fruit on the other side or whatever. Needed a break from Eve. No, he's there the whole time. So he's he listened to him as well. And this is not good because the voice they're listening to is not the Lord, which just brings us back to all of our issues as well. So, Pastor, anything else as I mentioned those things? Yeah, just as with the garden, the order is wrong. Here, the order is wrong, right? She's coming to that, coming to him and, and saying that she's got an answer to the problem that God has. God's got a problem. He can't do it. Obviously, she's coming to that conclusion that he can't or he hasn't or he won't or whatever. Um, so she's going to uh, somehow help God out as if God needs her help to come to an answer here. So the order is wrong because it's not, where did they seek the Lord in all this? Where did they, you know, uh, get a clear word that this is what they were supposed to do? Um, the, uh, the the one thing later, it, it, you know, we have to be clear too. I mean, it's, it's not, uh, this, uh, this isn't a text that's not a, a, that's against matrimony too. Because mm-hmm. then it talks about how she, Hagar, became his wife. Mm-hmm. So it is, it is much different culturally than we are, too. Uh, therefore, it's not that, you know, uh, they had an open relationship. You know, right. we, start, right. we start putting in 2022 20, mindsets into this. And it's like, no, that's, that's really clearly not what's happening. And Luther talks about it in a much different way that, um, so we'll, we'll get to some of those points in in just a bit, but yeah, it's, it's, um, culturally different though. You are correct. That doesn't mean that that culture was better or right. (laughs) It's, It's obviously when more people are brought into the marriage, the more struggle that there is. And there is not a good example where it's like, Oh, look how well this worked out. It never works out. Mm-hmm. So why do, why do people keep doing it? Uh, thanks be to God, uh, here for our church, we are we're very clear that this is not what God had in mind, and therefore let let us not run in that direction because the examples uh, lead to more hardship and sin. And so the part that really is interesting to me is the the part of listening that. What voices do we listen to? And we will give a lot of advice in this world. Um, for example, one of the advices is make sure you get plenty of sleep because a lot of times you make the worst decisions when you're tired. When you're when you're when you're tired, and this is just kind of good, natural. I would say kind of a natural law type of advice that you know I should get more sleep. You should get more sleep because then we are more equipped to be able to take on the vocations that God has given to us. And here it's just a very clear case of. We need to listen to the Lord, like you said, <laughs> that it's obvious this is not going to work out. It never works out, but yet we will still listen to those voices, if I can say it that way, that are not pointing us to Christ. And Pastor, what would your encouragement be to our listeners and to me and probably to yourself about why it's important for us to listen to the Lord, even if it sounds very um, in, very, uh, very nice to hear these other voices? Any thoughts? Yeah, I would say, you know, we... I think we would, and we hear with the members, you know, that, um, doesn't God want me to be happy? We start, we start making these deals. We start reasoning instead of seeing how the Lord acts and the Lord acts in a way of bearing the cross for him, for himself, he bore the cross. Therefore, as we're in Christ, we should understand that our call will also be to bear the cross. That doesn't mean that life doesn't have any joy, uh, but that, happiness and today's happiness is not my primary goal but faithfulness is and I'm going to be faithful to him who is far greater and his faithfulness 
to his promise to me. Uh, so, yeah, I think it, I don't want to get in the sense that I, I, I think I could have handled it better. Right, right. I, I am a, uh, 10 years is a long time <laughs> and, and their walk was a hard walk. Um, I have great sympathy, but it's, it's not going to, you know, that doesn't mean that um, we can look uh, and have a blind eye to this is just clearly wrong. They were wrong. That's he it. was wrong. That's he was it. wrong. This was not the right thing to do. Um, though, even in this, God shows his mercy. Even mm. in this. And this is where it's good for us as Christians, and I want to say this before we take our break, is we as Christians sometimes will speak as if, well, I was young when I made that decision. I was under a lot of stress when I made that decision. Even as simple as, for example, when I'm short with my bride or I'm I'm not being the best father that I need to be. I need to, you know, I need to be above this or to take on my role in a different way. It's not time for me to say, you know, it's been stressful. You know, you guys kept me up late last night. I had I had Mexican food and that wasn't good for me, whatever. I can make all the excuses in the world when I just need to repent and seek forgiveness. Yeah. And that's what we need to be able to do. And that's the key in this whole thing too, because God is merciful and God is gracious. And we know that promise as we live out our vocations every day. So let's uh, let's get to our break though. We are studying Genesis chapter 16 with Pastor John Shank, and we will be right back. Take a look around you. Look closely. Immigrants in the United States and their U.S.-born children now number about 81 million people, or 26% of the population. So chances are there's someone right in your community who doesn't speak English as a first language and who doesn't know Jesus. The Lutheran Heritage Foundation can help by providing you with free Lutheran books translated into over 90 languages. See their complete list of catechisms and Bible storybooks at lhfmissions.org. And welcome back. We are studying Genesis chapter 16 with Pastor John Shank of Trinity Lutheran Church and School in Edwardsville, Illinois. Pastor, we better keep moving along here. There's so much practical things for our day to day that we could dig into, but let's keep moving. We are in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 16. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw this, she had conceived. She looked with contempt on her mistress. I'm, I'm going to stop there, Pastor, because the, 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 it's just... This is a simple story, and you think it would be easy. Is this an easy thing? Like, this is what you wanted, correct? <laughs> you wanted a child to come at some point in some way, and it happened. And so why would she look at her mistress with contempt? What are your thoughts? So, so now this is um, Hagar looking with contempt on uh, Sarai. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, because, the way and, you're right. You're right. You're right. Fair enough. Right. So, uh, and, and it's going to go back and forth. It's it going to go the other way real quick here. <laughs> it's going to go the other way. But, um, so, as, uh, you know, as I said with, with Luther's commentary, it seems really interesting what, how he draws this out, that we have Hagar here, who is, who is no one. I mean, she has nothing. She's a servant girl. She's a slave. She had the clothes on her back and the food that was given to her and her duties that she was called to do. And um, as Luther talks about it, I know it sounds really strange. It even sounds strange to have it come out of my mouth. Um, but he's almost talking about the blessing that Sarai gave to Hagar to be able to be a mother. So she gave her the right to become a mother. Oh and now, now that she is a mother and the mother of the great patriarch Abram's child, now that she can, she can look at Sarai and say, "I'm the, I'm actually the true wife," and it's like, well, how did how did Luther see all that? How did he, uh, maybe some holy speculation? But it seems to be fitting, right, that she could look at uh, Sarai and say, "Well, you see how God blessed me. My marriage is the true marriage, 
And if yours marriage was a true marriage, God would have blessed you with a child. So you see this rot, the, and that's why multiplicity in marriage is never going to work, right? There's always going to be rivalry. There's always going to be jealousy. There's always going to be dividing. What was supposed to be uniting of one man and one woman is now divided, and you can't divide yourself out like that. You just, it's not going to work. And we see here it doesn't work. Um, so she, uh, Luther talks about how Hagar should have been thankful, rejoicing that in this gift of new life and the gift of motherhood, and rejoicing that Sarai had given to allow this to happen because she was her, um, uh, she was over her, right? Mm-hmm. She was over her and gave her the ability to have this gift. Um, and she turns and, and is using it that, that now, now she has kind of surpassed Sarai, and that's just not the case. And now the struggle continues between her, Sarai, and then later on between her child and the child of the promise. And that, that is a fascinating twist. I, I, I did not look at that close enough. Like you said, it was Hagar who <laughs> looked with contempt on Sarai. And you think, yeah. and, and, and Luther does capture in a way that I don't think we would have thought. Just captures in a way, well, well why, why this is a gift to you, which, you know, that, that's still kind of a struggle to say out loud. But it is right. uh, it's a gift to you. Now you are, you know, you have a son. You're going to have a son to great Abraham and many sons. I mean, this this is what a blessing that you have, and now you have contempt. So it it the the emotions, the the messiness, the anxiety of everything is absolutely everywhere, and it doesn't get better as we go through the text. Anything else? Three and four, Pastor. I think the only thing that helps us understand how Luther is taking it and how it appears to be playing out in the text is to understand not the relationship as much between um, Abram and Hagar, but the the reality that she is a mother and the cultural and the, I mean, the significance of that is hard for us as maybe even me as a guy to even understand, but to, 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 to see this in life and the mothers of my congregation, the joy of having a child and the pain of, of not and the struggle of miscarriage or the struggle of barrenhood, um, that this is real. And so when we see it played out in the in the Bible, we can see how real the scriptures are. And this is this is real history. This is this is real pain. This is a real struggle of a woman who was barren and now uh, her the one who's supposed to be under her, serving her, is feeling like she is greater than her, that God loves me more because look at the gift I have and you do not have it. Mm. And so the promise is being thrown back in her face. You know? And that's my encouragement to, to you listeners. One, if you are, if you are a, a family who's not able to have children, uh, this, is, this text is something that reminds you of that brokenness, but also I encourage you to see the mercy of our Lord as we look at the text today as well. And for all of us to pray for families who are not able to have children, and, and to ask for the Lord's mercy to be upon them as they grieve. And, and it's, it's a lot like when Job lost much of his family and much of his possessions. His friends came, and it says they were silent for seven days. Sometimes that's what people need is the space, prayer, and the mercy of God. And that's what our Lord gives. So let's, let's continue on, verses 5 and 6. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. <laughs> Poor Abram in this situation. Okay. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord Yahweh judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. Pastor, okay. My sympathy for Abram is not long lived, just so you know. <laughs> when right. when right. what he right. says, but it is that moment where this happens. Clearly, he. I mean, I would think he would not be comfortable. It doesn't tell us this, but he could not be comfortable with this situation, as he is clearly not following God's will with Hagar. Okay, then all of a sudden, Hagar is not happy, and he probably knew that somehow. Now Sarai is not happy, and then he kind of diverts, you know, he takes away his vocation as a husband and as like, and as one who is this woman who's bearing his child. And he kind of just 
hands off. You know, I'm going to wash my hands of this. No big deal. So the sin is just being passed around once again, like Adam and Eve. Well, this woman you gave to me. Oh, it was a serpent who did this to me as opposed to, um, well, repentance and taking responsibility and asking for the Lord's grace. Your thoughts? Yeah. So when I when I first read this, and it seems like, okay, what is Sarah doing? <laughs> it seems, it seems um, the fickleness of it, it seems overwhelming, right? That you, you are being mad that Abram did exactly what you told him to do? Like, what are you talking about? But I, I think what really is happening here is not really about the action about being with Hagar, because that's what she wanted, she wanted a child. But you could imagine, and it seems like this is maybe playing out here, uh, that now she has conceived a child. Now she is, so she is also Abram's wife, but Abram's wife who is under his first wife to take care of her, to, to minister to her as a slave girl. Okay, so now his new wife has a child in which Sarai could not do. Well, when a new uh, a person is expecting, there's a lot of doting, there's a lot of rejoicing, everything is turning towards Hagar and, and maybe even Abram too. And maybe in his joy of having a child, this is his child, that maybe he's overlooking how she's not doing her duties. She's not paying respect to how she used to have to pay respect. So I think that mm-hmm. is really what she's upset about. Not that he did what she's supposed to, but she's, he's not putting her in her place. She, he's part of the problem. Uh, Abram, you're mm-hmm. looking at her like, like she's me. She's not me. And the child that she has is supposed to be my child. It was supposed to be my child. That's what this arrangement was. This was supposed to be my child. And now you're looking at her like, like she's got a, a higher standing in this household than I do. You need to do something about that. This sin is your sin by, by elevating her uh, above me. And so obviously uh, may this be a warning to everyone who ever thinks that the, that that the Bible promotes, um, you know, uh, multiplicity of marriage or or whatever. It's not, it's broken. That sin is broken. This is, uh, you know, never going to work. If we just listen to the clear word of the Lord in Genesis and in, in Matthew from the, the word of Jesus and, uh, and trust him. And so, um, uh, so then he, he turns back to Sarah and say, no, she's your servant. You, you need to deal with this. She does. And she seems to do it pretty harshly. She disciplines harshly uh, her uh, servant girl. And then she, she runs off. And, <laughs> That is so messy and no amount of, of, uh, I would say, couples therapy um, (laughs) would fix this, um, per se. Uh, The the complexity of it is is so grand and so great that you, they, in the midst of the storm, would have a very difficult time trying to fully understand where everyone's coming from. And, and you broke that down so great, uh, Pastor Shank, because her, Sarai's struggle was, 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 was uh, I mean, the, the list could go on forever. And then the struggle for Hagar is going to be there forever. And for him, he's trying to do something, but he's also diverting. And so it just, you see it over and over again. And it's very important that I don't hear many people justifying polygamy or various multiplicities of marriage based on scripture anymore. That was about 10 years ago, maybe, that you heard some of that. But this is a very clear case because something's in the Bible. And this is good for you to know our listeners is just because it's in the Bible does not mean it's promoted by God. You know, Um, Noah getting drunk after getting off the ark that happened, but that was not, that's not promoted. And because of this relationship, happening is very clear this is not god saying you know what this is actually a pretty good way to live life no clearly it's not because he's not uplifting any part of it whatsoever so it's, that's the important task of interpretation of scripture letting scripture interpret scripture and to see for what it fully is pastor anything else in these uh, first six verses 
Uh, no, because I, I, yeah, I think we have a lot to talk about in the next <laughs> section here too. All yeah. right, let's get to it. So, verse seven: the angel of the Lord Yahweh found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord Yahweh said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so they cannot be numbered for the multitude. Pastor, I, I, we have, we, we, the angel of the Lord arrives. How do you want to start us off as we look at who is this angel of the Lord and what is he doing? So if it if it wasn't for the next part, I'd have a hard time saying, okay, well, is this just I mean, an angel of the Lord can be mm-hmm. an angel of the Lord, and there's nothing more to that than um, than you know we we know that the angels are uh, created beings of of God and messengers, and they bring a message. And we see that in Scripture. Uh, some are named, most are not. And um, there we go. Uh, this is the angel bringing it. But then later, uh, in, into the section where there's interaction, um, the angel of the Lord said, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitudes. So um, that is, that's not, you know, Sarai knows that, that it's only the Lord that gives children and the Lord that has kept her. Uh, from having children to this point. Um, we understand the promise, but at this point. So uh, the angel, speaking of things that the angel you can't do um, outside the, the that God is doing it. So And then later on, uh, how she talks about, how Hagar talks about this interaction uh, makes it clear that this has got to be more. Now, Ab- uh, Abram, uh, now Luther talks uh, about this mainly as an angel, but he, he does concede, uh, was his uh, Hillary? Uh, yeah, Hillary says that this is God himself, so he does at least acknowledge that there is a struggle there, that there is a thought that, that this, this could be, this really could be more as we have other, um, uh, you know, uh, theophany uh, of God. And so as we look at that, the, the angel Lord comes, and the angel Lord has a message. And what's that message to Hagar? So the message, uh, one, uh, and I think it's really interesting, is um, where have you come from and where are you going? Now, this could just mean that where are you come from, you, you are, as he, as he addresses her, Hagar, uh, servant of Sarai, mm. this is who you are. This is a vocation that you have been given. Um, wh- why are you running from it? Why aren't you? Why aren't you trusting that the Lord is with you in that? Uh, but also, where are you? Where, where are you coming from? And where are you going? Also talks about her. I think maybe a little uh, speculation on my part. I think it also brings to mind her past. She was uh, from Egypt, so it's like, oh, are you going back to where you were from? Mm. Are you going back to those gods? Are you going back to that life of idolatry? I called you from that. And it seems like Hagar is a believer because how she interacts uh, with with this angel or with God, uh, that her um, she shouldn't be going back there. So what, one way he's just calling her back to, uh, obviously by the end, calling her back to her uh, mistress, um, her Lord and Lady uh, Abram and and Sarai, and to do her duty with with fear and trembling to the Lord, um, even though it means that there's hardship there, and I think there's something there too that, that God is not saying that, that that there's not a hardship for you, but you've been called to trust trust in the Lord, and He's heard it. He's heard your cries. He's heard your cries, and He sees you in your affliction. And by the way, He's going to bless you. He's going to bless you. And I, I think seeing God's uh, amazing mercy and grace in this is, is pretty overwhelming. And it is. And this is where I think we, as you, as you mentioned, we probably should read a little more into it because it ends with, you know, the same promise that you hear for Abram and Sarai, I will surely multiply your offspring so they cannot be numbered for multitude. And without more of a context, 
we could get really caught up in that question. So let's, I'm going to, I'm going to read the rest of our text because there's a lot here. Verse 11. And the angel of the Lord said to Hagar, Behold, you are pregnant, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord Yahweh has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called on the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seen. For she said, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well should be called Be'er Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram, a son. And Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So we get this promise, like you said, very similar language uh, to Mary, right? Um, very similar language. Uh, language that we hear to Abram and Sarai, obviously there's some differences here. So can you, how do you want to break this down, 11 through 16? Yeah, I, I think um, even though even though that she is she is not Sarai, and Sarai and Mary are, are should be um, looked at very similarly because we've got a seed of the woman, Sarai, a promise to a person who should not have had a child, receives a child. Mary, who should not have had a child, receives a child um, by only the means that God can give. This young maiden is not Sarai, uh, and and yet God in his mercy uh, deems to bless her. And I, I think it's partly, it's got to be, it's got to be in her relation to, to, to Abram. She is Abram's wife now, and the child for which she bears is is um, not the child of the promise that will be clear, but a child of of Abram nonetheless. Um, well, actually, the last month, uh, but also true. And in that uh, in that relation and in that closeness to Abram, she's also blessed. And in her affliction, God has seen. her her. He has listened to her. I think there's just, um, you know, many things that we as individual Christians can reflect on that and say that the Lord does, even if I'm not Mary, even if I'm not Sarah, even if I'm not Abraham, the Lord still sees me. The Lord still listens to my prayers too. Um, He still cares for me. And he saw that with her. Um, And so you can be, be reassured that the Lord does see your afflictions. You're not too small. Um, God is God is great enough to see us all and to hear us all, and He does. And that blessing to, to her is 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 pretty immense. No, there is struggle in it too. The <laughs> fact that He's going to be a wild donkey and He's going to be a fighter and He's against everyone, everyone's against Him, kind of plays out in history too. It yeah. does. It does. Oh my, does it ever? And it's interesting because Ishmael literally means God hears. Which I, I I didn't re research much on that. Did you look at, up up at that all the Ishmael name and God hears and how that plays out for Ishmael? It's kind of an interesting uh, uh, way of looking at the, his name. Just uh, just the fact that in, you know in the, in the in the text it, it's um, using that language because of her struggle and how the Lord heard her in her struggle and her running off uh, that the Lord heard her. Uh, and, and comes to her, therefore Ishmael, that God has heard her. And um, then later, you know, as we see in um, uh, verse 13, mm-hmm. uh, you are God who, who uh, of seeing. Ah, God of good seeing. point. So yep. God sees too. So, um, yeah, it didn't go further than that, but just the reality of, of what she is enduring and and how she she's called to endure her her domestic duties to to Sarai, to Abram, to this household, um, trusting that the Lord does see you. I see you. I see your affliction. You can you can face mistreatment. You can go back and submit um, because I'm with you. I'm with you, and, and that, I think that's helpful for us too. It's a great it's a great um because you know we we speak about God being uh, I've seen God face to face. You know this is a wrestling with God. 
uh, I've wrestled with God and and have won. That's a whole other, we'll have that later on in Genesis. But we see Emmanuel, God with us. And I love this language is because, you know, we know God hears us, right, in prayer. Uh, and here we know that God sees us because, you know, that old language of children are to be, you know, seen but not heard kind of language this is old, not necessary today, but it was in the past. And it's interesting here that there's times that we just want to know we've been seen. You know, yeah. we want to be seen and, and God provides <laughs> that need for us by seeing us, knowing us hearing us and here it brings that aspect of being seen any thoughts on that you know you heard that language i just want to be seen and for hagar the lord saw her and why is that important for you know how would you encourage our listeners that the god that the lord sees you yeah so it's so easy to feel forgotten and so then as you know you uh, have encouraged us to care for each other especially to care for for those who are going through great times of mourning and struggle um those can be uh, about your family or, or, or whatever's going on in the life of the church together. Well, some of that can just be a comfort to know that someone else sees what I'm going through. I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not making up that this is a real struggle and we can acknowledge that I, I see what you're going through. I see it. And then how much more that we can say in the Lord sees it too. And he wants oh. to comfort you with my presence with the presence of his word and the presence of his son as we come and gather together as he feeds and nourishes you at the table. He sees you and he, he hears you. So come and receive his answer, which is to feed and nourish you. Here's the language used in Exodus, right? The burning bush. I just thought about this. Three, uh, Exodus verse chapter 3, verse 7. Then the Lord Yahweh said to Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering and have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. That's a language that is used quite explicitly in Scripture that you are not forgotten. Um, and I, I think that's a language that, well, I think I need to preach better because it really is God sees and understands your, and incarnationally understands your sufferings so that you are not forgotten. That is a, boy, that is a great, great insight that we receive from the text today. Pastor, any other, any other insights? We have about three minutes left in our time as we look at the rest of chapter 16. Yeah, I, I think there's a, a call to bear the cross, right? Mm -hmm. Sarah was called. Sarai was called to bear the cross of, of waiting. Abram was called to bear the cross of waiting. They had received his promise. They had heard that, that the Lord would uh, work this um, great blessing of, of making someone who was not a, a people into his people. That that Abram would bear his name, God's name, as his own people, and and yet he had to bear it without seeing it. Uh, he didn't get to see the fullness of having a multitude of, of children as the stars in, in heaven or the sands on the seashore. But the promise was still sure. The promise was, was still true. And I think that's a struggle that our own members can face as they're going through chemo treatment or laying in a hospital bed or maybe as alone because their spouse has died. Has God forgotten my needs? Has he forgotten me? The reality is he sees you, and he knows what we need, even, even if it's calling us to, to bear the cross in faithfulness, because as we bear our struggle uh, faithfully, we become a great witness to those around me. I was just recently speaking to two, uh, two sons of, of one of uh, a member of my congregation, and their, their father is a faithful witness in the midst of his cancer. He has um, remained uh, uh, not just positive, but positively um, trusting in the Lord, that no matter what happens, um, the Lord is his Lord. He is a Savior, and he will be with the Lord uh, for all eternity because of what Christ has done. So we can bear the crosses, uh, not because that it means that I, I know everything's going to work out just how I want it to be. Sarah, Sarah, I want it to work out how she wanted it to be. No, it's going to work out on God's plan, which is so much greater than my plan. Because his plan was 
was to save me. His plan is to resurrect me. His plan is for me to spend eternity with him in his ever presence. So, yeah, as we reflect on this text, we can say, well, yes, Lord, I I can submit to the authorities of this world. I can submit to my boss. I can submit to these things, as you called Hagar to submit, Mm -hmm. um, because you are with her, you are with me, um, and we see this perfectly in your son. I think it, it just goes back to what we see in Genesis throughout. God will provide. But right now, we're out of time. So Pastor Shank of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois, giving us God's strong word from Genesis chapter 16. Pastor Shank, thank you for bringing us his gifts. Thank you. God's peace. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hand. Thank you.